Hello and welcome to another video lesson on the Britain 1900 to 1951 course. Starting with the usual disclaimer, we do not cover the specific information you need. You need to do, get that from your own reading. This is for analysis um, and argument based stuff. So this is the second of the three crises between 1910 and 1914. This one is about the women's suffrage campaign and in reality actually it's 1908 from, until 1914 and even then you can mention stuff before that but it's just neat to say there are three crises at the end of the period. So what we're focusing on today is the idea of essentially why does the women, campaign for women's suffrage fail by 1914. Um, so before we look at the actions of the suffrage campaigners, it's important to understand the concept of femininity in this era. Women are not hated by men. Women are daughters, women are sisters, women are mothers, women are wives. And although they are certainly, particularly to our modern eye, treated incredibly badly, that badly, or that bad treatment doesn't always or necessarily come from simple hate and particularly if people are conforming to how women are expected to do actually there's relatively rare amounts of hate hate is reserved for those who do not conform about how genders should be women are infantilized being the ideal woman is about being demure childlike naive sweet etc and therefore women were seen almost as idealized humans in a way that children are seen as idealized humans i.e. they're innocent um, they can be engaging etc now this is not necessarily any better than being hated this is just being patronized and also being um, artificially limited but still it is not simply they men hated women because women were seen as only being um, simple and being unable to sort of manage emotionally or intellectually uh, many of the stresses and drains of life there's very few expectations of women um, to have jobs outside of motherhood and therefore they don't require much of an education and therefore women are in seen as being intellectually incapable and being naive and um, to naive to involve be involved by political engagement and in some quarters there's even an argument that women all get corrupted by the um, act, act of getting involved in politics. Women are these innocent, demure, childlike individuals who crack on and you know, don't complain. And if you soon as you introduce the grubby politics, they might turn to something that you don't like. And in particular, Victoria's quote that women will become one of the worst, disgusting forms of life if they get the vote um, really reflects this. And so if we have a look at lots of the assumptions around femininity, you can see it here in anti-suffrage posters. The arguments against women having the right to vote uh, ranges from the left-hand side where you see the idea that women are fundamentally incapable. They gossip, they're a bit silly, and this meeting of the cabinet ministers is just or women busy being busybody, i.e. they're intellectually incapable of engaging with the task. There's also the idea of um, uh, feminine, the woman's job is in the home, is in looking after children and doing the chores, and therefore they are failing in their gender roles of being a mother if they, if they push for um, women's rights and they push for the suffrage because they are not conforming to the how women should be. Likewise, suffragettes are seen as harlots when read um, uh, of uh, scarlet dress of the harlot and therefore seen as being again the corrupting of what pure honest innocent femininity is women will become greedy and selfish and therefore that will become very negative negative. and if you look at that far right poster the image of what a woman is um, who doesn't want the vote i.e. stoic proud well dressed um, lordly and also upper class compared to the um, rushing around, unfeminine, unpoised, clearly more working class woman who's pushing for the votes. Um, and therefore, you ha essentially, what underlines all of these policies and all these responses is this basic assumption that women are, it is undesirable to give women the right to vote because of a range of um, either they are too infantilized, either then they will lose their place in society, or they will become corrupted by it. So, between 1906 and 1914, after decades of slow passive campaigning, we see a real upsurge in the intensity and also tactics used by campaigners. 
for decades, um, the NUWSS, the suffragists, have been pushing for a slow passive campaign. Okay, when the women's suffrage movement and the moderates tend to push up there, they then they decide around the turn of the century to have more public meetings, have more public discussions, but they fundamentally conform to the gender roles. Whereas there's also a more militant faction who try and use more militant actions and violence in order to try and get their message heard. So in 1906, what really happens is this general feeling that they, women need to try more, both if they're moderate or more radical, um, coincides with a couple of other factors. So the liberal landslide, because they are the party of political reform, they're the party who really push for voting reform, they're the party who gets stuff done, many women hope that when the liberals come to power, the women will get the right to vote. But as we shall see, that doesn't necessarily happen. And in particular, Asquith annoys many, many women, including more moderate women, by um, refusing to give time to a 1908 bill which had passed the first reading and had Asquith given time to that bill something that did not cost him much political capital or effort that bill probably since it passed the first reading would have passed and given some women the right to vote but Asquith's personal objection to the idea of women getting the right to vote meant that that died in that session. It did not have time and therefore it ran out of time and therefore it did not get passed. This causes a lot of anger because this, I, this, many, many hopes have been riding on this bill and in particular it passed the first time. Most people assumed it would pass um, unheeded from there. And to have a man so personally stand in the way, particularly someone who they, they had previously seen as an ally, that caused a lot of problems. Similarly, <clears throat> the increasing organisation and um, strategies of the Irish and trade unions in agitating for reform creates an atmosphere where women in turn feel like they want to agitate for reform. And as well as that, the w WSPU and their militant actions, which we'll look at in a second, do help bring the discussion to the public discussion. And once it's in public discussion, more women get involved, which then leads to an upsurge in the campaign for female franchise. Okay? Arguably, the coercive response of the government also then led to the more women campaigning, because as women were, un in some views, disproportionately punished for being involved in the um, suffragette campaign, then the, when many women saw the injustice or thought they saw the injustice in the actions of the government and joined up in revenge. So you can argue this causes a cycle because then these women get involved in militant actions and then the government react and that inspires more people to join. So before we get on to the actions of the suffragists and suffragettes, we really need to focus on what are the positions of the various political parties on this issue. And essentially the first one shouldn't be too much of a surprise. The Conservatives are the most traditional in their social values. Women are mothers, women are stoic, women are infantilized, etc., etc., which are really massively helped by the Conservative Party. And therefore, they are very suspicious of anything, for example, voting, which disturbs that gender paradigm, that sense of women are X and men are Y. Um, as well as this, if you give women the vote, yes, you might get some rich women voting, but you'll get far more working class women voting. And this means that actually, if you look at the average voter, they will become more working class as time goes on. So this is a bad thing. Particularly, this will then therefore give even more voters who would not in no way vote for them and give votes to Liberals and Labour. So they have a really entrenched reason, both morally, but also politically to avoid it. Similarly, the Liberals, you would think, would be more sympathetic, and some were, but there was fundamental splits in the Liberal Party about this. Some in the Liberal Party fear that, like the Conservatives, if you give all women the vote, the working class women will end up being a little bit um, over, massively overrepresented in the electorate. That means there's more working class votes um, than average, and therefore this will benefit the Labour Party, not the Liberals. Okay. There are many liberals, particularly on the Gladstonian win, who support the traditional gender ideas okay, and therefore think that actually society probably shouldn't necessarily be challenged or shouldn't be affected by these constitution, um, by uh, these, the, giving women, women the right to vote. 
as well as that some think yeah it may be an issue but there's bigger constitutional issues getting all men the right to vote changing the house of lords etc and therefore they're not willing to spend time and effort and political capital fighting for women's rights when there are other more pressing things on they want to get plural voting that's alternative vote for example which helps the party house of lords reform electoral reform whatever it happens to be they all want different things but they do not want that because that's less important women's rights are less important and then some um, also fear and actually to be honest if you look at what happens after 1918 this is arguably isn't necessarily incorrect as an assumption they believe that since women are naturally focused on uh, motherhood and well, actually this isn't the reason why they do it but like this is what happens um, believe in motherhood and, the, and this sort of very patronising idea that they are very simplistic and therefore easily scared by um, Tory rabble-rousing. Because of that, um, what might happen is that um, these people might be full foul and be seduced by, uh, into being a natural Tory voter. And so what we see is the Liberals, because of their splits and because they are deeply concerned and because they not agree, basically do nothing as a result. Now, the last party, you may expect a bit more um, women friendliness from are the Labour Party. Arguably, the Labour Party is a party of socialism. Socialism equals equality, ergo women's equality. In reality, that's not the case any, in any way, shape or form. The working class in this period, and therefore the trade unions, who are basically microcosms of working class culture, are deeply socially conservative. So outside of a few and usually more middle class and Labour Party socialist members, most working class and trade unionists do not believe that women's rights is a real pressing issue. And in fact, they do not really care about it. And many of them actually actively resisting any attempts to remove the um, paradigm. Never assume just because you're, people are a Labour supporter that they are socially cons um, e uh, liberal. They may well be economically progressive, um, but certainly not socially. So therefore, we see a lot of um, a lack of real desire and push from the party and the unions. And if the party and unions really wanted it, McDonald will follow suit. Okay, um, and we see much less of a, of a shift than one, one would expect. Similar to that, and related to that, is in reality, like the Liberals, the Labour Party think there's far, far more pressing battles that they need to fight. It is far more important that they get all men the right to vote, which will then massively benefit the Labour Party, than it is to get women the right to vote. And again, like the Liberals, they are somewhat sceptical skeptical that women will um, vote for the Labour Party. Um, they suspect that they will, might well vote for the Tories, and that will be a terrible thing for them because that will lead to pretty much um, uh, their uh, a counterproductive effect on their um, actions, etc. Uh, on, on their electability, for example. So therefore, there's no natural party. Labour has a few. George Lansbury um, is one who resigned their seat in protest of the lack of action, but in reality, there's no massive action at all. Okay, towards this sort of women's rights stuff. So, therefore, the, since there's no natural political party who really wants to push the idea of reform, we will see that um, the women have to agitate and force reform on their own backs. And so, enter the various actions and the various actors in the women's um, suffrage campaign. So, the context. The average... Um, political situation is the political parties do not want this change. How therefore do you persuade people to make this change? Well you need to put pressure on them. Now there are two mechanisms in which you do this and this um, two different philosophies are what underpin the two different approaches. So essentially women lack political power. They cannot physically vote in people who will give them the right to vote because they don't have the right to vote. So therefore the government needs to be pressured to vote. The way that happens if you can't pressure them through saying I won't vote for you so you better vote you better do it you have to either number one create a ground so of popular support amongst people who can vote
by persuading them the moral case, by making the case out to be the good guys, by basically putting a lot of moral pressure, and by persuading people, particularly the pit type, the people who vote for that party in power, i.e., the people who vote for the Liberal Party, by persuading them to support women's suffrage, they will then in turn indirectly pressure the government then to make change. The second way. And that's very passive, um, etc. So that's about persuasion, and that's the power is largely with the people you're trying to persuade. They have to be persuaded. The second way is to um, force a debate. Um, and the way you force debate is you get you do propaganda by the deed, i.e., you do actions which grab people's attention. And by doing those actions grab attention, you force a debate. And by forcing debate, you can argue number I that the natural righteousness of your cause will be self-evident. Now, in reality, that's very optimistic. People won't, if you burn down a post box, it's unlikely people will suddenly believe you. But you can argue that the, by bringing attention to the cause, it starts a debate. And then people will, even if they deplore the suffragette actions, they will say, but you know, there is a case to answer, blah, 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 blah. Additionally, if you use militancy, the government will then respond with coercion. If the government responds with coercion, particularly as the government with coercion tends to be a bit more un inartful and a bit more, um, on average, um, overly harsh, you can then turn yourself into the victims. And you can um, make gather a lot of political support, not necessarily for what you stand for, but because you are being victimised by the state. And so you can naturally use that to your advantage. So in reality, um, the women's rights groups are basically doing the same thing in different means. They are trying to influence popular opinion, one by persuasion, one by forcing a debate and also forcing the government to make a violent counter-reaction, which then looks bad on them. Um, and they are therefore, that will naturally generate enough pressure on government to make the change. So the suffragists, and, um, oh, and you can find lots more specific examples at your leisure, are essentially about doing the um, uh, peaceful pro um, campaigning. Now, what's very important to note is the suffragist approach is to conform to the gender stereotype. Suffragists are well-dressed, suffragists are demure, they, they are very conscious and assiduous in their conforming to what the expectations of women are. This is because they believe well, number one, they, are, they don't necessarily want to uh, create a larger feminist um, objective about equalising the rights of men's and women. Um, they are much more sort of moderate in their tone, particularly for this era. Um, additionally, um, they believe that if you go outside the gender role, if you start not acting like a lady should, they, you will be very quickly dismissed by men as radical. And men will not... You know, having been taught from a young age how women should be, will naturally be almost repulsed by women not acting as they should, and therefore will look at it as irrational, look at it as wrong, and therefore not have the sympathy of your campaign. So, therefore, if we really um, uh, think about it, the suffragists are not necessarily demure because they want to, but they are demure because of that's what's strategically sensible. So. What and what to, to what extent are the suffragists successful? So you can look up the specifics in your own time, but the suffragettes, um, suffragists um, campaigners essentially go by um, moral campaigning, public pressure, petitioning, etc., etc., leafleting. It's all very demure. It's all very you know doing as women should, etc., etc., conforming to gender stereotypes, and therefore largely unoffensive, but also does not force a debate. And what that means is. If men do not want to have a discussion about women's rights, they do not have to, because women, um, um, the suffragist campaign does not really make the debate go into people's newspapers, does not make the debate really um, sort of bring in, become part of um, the everyday life, and therefore can be easily ignored. Um, and so therefore, the big arguments of suffragists isn't necessarily that what they're doing is bad, it's that, and it isn't even that it isn't necessarily helpful, but it just leads to odierism. People going, oh, that's sad that women don't have the right to vote, but not really doing anything about it. Um, and in fact, that therefore means that you will spend ages and ages and ages not massively actually 
doing what people want you to do and not actually making a significant change. And so therefore, um, the suffragists, although they are good at keeping a ground sort of support, they aren't really forcing the government to actually do the deed, as it were, to actually lead to some change in policy. Arguably, their success was about providing a long-term assumption amongst many in society, particularly those who vote liberal and therefore the liberals listen to, that there probably should be some idea of women's suffrage. By having in the background a constant debate that suffrage is good, etc, 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 you are keeping alive an idea and as time gets on it becomes increasingly more um, acceptable. You can also say that by having the suffragists when the suffragettes do something quite aggressive or quite out of character or, well, not out of character, but like seen as quite negative, then um, what will happen is people will um, point to the suffragists and go, well, not all women are like that. Essentially, they are a counterpoint to the suffragettes. The, um, if it was just the suffragettes, it would be very easy for people who dislike suffrage to say all women are clearly, therefore, irrational and should never get the vote. But it's difficult for some um, uh, these people to say that because look, quite clearly looking at um, what the um, suffragists are like it's difficult to say that all women are irrational and therefore all women don't deserve the vote so basically it means that the actions of suffragettes are, and their damage they cause are somewhat mollified are somewhat mitigated by the fact that the suffragettes um, suffragists apologies um, are um, in existence because they can show that at least some women can be quote unquote responsible um, with the vote for example. So arguably um, by having the suffragettes it does limit the action of and the damage of the suffragettes, sorry, sorry by having the suffragettes you do limit the damage of the suffragettes and the final argument is by slowly getting sympathy for more and more people and getting the message out gradually this does create a ground sort of that perhaps there should be some reform and that will push it all the way to the tipping point the idea at the point in which everyone goes you know what let's have women having the right to vote etc 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 so that's the suffragettes probably just keep saying the wrong words that was suffragists now for suffragettes now in reality the common argument of suffragettes is what happens is they um, gained attention for the cause and therefore that helped now that actually is very simplistic oh and by the way no, don't say um, um, Davidson threw herself in front of a horse and that persuaded people that did not happen in any way shape or form a it was an accident and b it didn't persuade anyone um, the um, suffragettes do grab attention but, they, but uh, most answers are very unclear about how that actually helps women get the right um, to vote and in reality the answer is it doesn't massively um, getting attention helps get people focus on the debate, certainly, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't actually significantly mean that when people hear about women's right to vote, they are more likely to support it. If anything, the militant action suffragettes are counterproductive in that what they achieve is a profound um, anxiety, a profound um, anger towards the suffragettes, which then in turn leads to um, them being fundamentally unsupported by a majority of men. And therefore you can argue, oh, it's all well and good that women get attention, but if it's the wrong type of attention, if it's largely negative, how does that help them? Um, so therefore, while attention is not necessarily um, a bad or bad thing because it does help the public debate, if the public debate is negative, then it doesn't necessarily massively help. Um, as well as this, though, you can argue that it does at least bring the debate to public consciousness. People do think about um, women's suffrage, they do discuss it, they do consider it. And although they might not be convinced by the suffragettes, they are more willing to listen to the suffragist action. So the arguments in favour of the suffragettes is the idea that by ha doing these public actions, they are making it more of a public consciousness, they are making it more aware. Um, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing for the campaign. As well as this, by acting outside the gender roles, some historians have argued that actually this is great for women's rights because it begins this long process of persuading women, sorry men, that women are not simply infantile, um, childlike, um, innocent things to be protected. And therefore that in the long term encourages this idea that perhaps women can be trusted with the vote by subconsciously shifting the ideal nature of women and what a woman is 
and making women more a sense of agents of their own actions, even if in the short term it's negative. So arguably you have the suffragists providing a gentle pressure but not forcing a debate and you have the suffragettes um, gaining attention but actually not massively helping people and maybe hatch, shift, making people talk about women's rights and well women's right to vote at least but actually not persuading people and actually what it tends to do actually react, in reality is turn men off and the most important thing is actually it gives the government the moral high ground not to give women suffrage because you can, we've all had the phrase we don't negotiate with terrorists this exact same mentality what the liberal government say and what the opponents of suffrage of, of women's suffrage say is we can't possibly even if we morally agree with women getting the right to vote we cannot possibly give women the right to vote simply because um, they have used violence. If, they, if we allow them, if we give in to them using violence and, and threats, what will happen with the Irish? What will happen with the, the socialists? We therefore, even if you like women's, the idea of women's right to vote, you must resist it on the basis that um, we cannot give in to militant accents. So argue it's ultimately counterproductive um, in what the suffragettes do. Um, and therefore the only argument for the suffragettes is it does bring attention to the cause but again it's negative attention it does heat, keep the public debate going but it's not a public debate that people massively um, feel sorry for the suffragettes in even Emily Davidson who accidentally died in front of the king's horse um, uh, she was viewed as you know she was viewed as a culpable person she was culpable for this the victim was the horse and the victim was the jockey not Emily Davidson. People did not pity her. She created that situation. Now, the actions of the Liberal government also helped um, the women's suffrage movement to not really force the vote. Number one, Asquith was personally against women's suffrage. And so, for example, we talked about the 1908 bill where he was instrumental in making it fail. It probably would have passed had, it, had Asquith given it the time. There's no reason why he didn't give it the time apart from personal prejudice. So he really stood in the way and had that bill gone through, there would have been at least some reform. You can argue as well that the government's reaction, some people say the government's reaction to suffragettes and militancy actually made the, the, um, the women's campaign for suffrage stronger, i.e. by force feeding women who had starved themselves in prison and by in doing the cat and mouse act that um, all that suffragette propaganda that happened as a result persuaded many people to, you know, that the um, the government was bad, led to support and sympathy for the women, and therefore led to political pressure on the government. That is not true. Um, most people, most politicalised people, actually looked at what the government was doing and saw it was fair in response to the militancy of the suffragettes. They fundamentally did not believe in the morality of the cause, and therefore of, of using violence towards the cause. So therefore they viewed the violence and response to violence as legitimate. So actually the force feeding was not largely a motivating factor in most people's decision and whether to support or not. They did not massively care about the force feeding. So um, the, although yes the propaganda from the suffragettes is huge, it does not resonate, it doesn't hit people, it doesn't actually make them change their minds too much. And similarly, the government justifies the lack of change on voting rights by saying they are not going to give in to militancy. This is a very effective argument. This works very well to stop there, to make sure that you don't have to listen to militancy. And it means you don't have to make change. Because even people who in your party who morally agree with the idea that women should get the right to vote um, cannot disagree with the logic, really, that if you allow people to use militancy to change the government's opinion that will only embolden other people to do the same thing and lead to chaos. So actually the actions of the government are fundamental in preventing women getting the right to vote. Not in some case, in some ways, like Asquith, it actively stops it. In others, it mitigates the damage done by the suffragettes and the, the effects of the suffragette action by being relatively reasonable but still firm and painting it in the right light. The, the suffragettes ideal situation where the government reacts to their militancy and the government looks like the bad guys does not happen. And therefore, without that, militancy is just putting people off. So overall, therefore, if you look at each group, each group does not provide the killer blow, as it were, to get women the right to vote. They, um, the suffragettes are arguing force the debate more, but make it into a negative debate. So that is not massively helpful. So overall, why did it fail? 
the campaign in context of the working class agitation of industrial unrest and the crisis in Ireland was seen as radical and dangerous. And therefore the public, and um, this is the suffragette campaign, the public did not massively support it. And without government, without support of the masses, you cannot pressure the government. If the masses believe and agree with what the government is doing, you are doing your job wrong if you're trying to pressure the government. You only put pressure on the government by making people who vote for the government change their mind about something and therefore the government kind of feel like they have to change their mind. That does not happen. The government similarly was... Um, Therefore, since it would refuse to give in to militancy and gave a very strong moral argument why they shouldn't give in, give um, women's rights reform, i.e. giving in to terrorism, giving in to violence, um, this basically destroyed the debate and basically meant that the dream of forcing the debate and forcing people to um, listen and sympathize with the suffragettes because of the government in action actually does not work. And you can argue that the suffragist campaign was slowly working. But the suffragettes undercut that campaign. The suffragettes really, really hurt that campaign because people who had been slowly brought on board, and there's loads of specific evidence about how the number of MPs declines uh, over time as the suffragettes get more and more violent. And there's quotes from Lloyd George, although I never could trust a quote from George Lloyd George. He's always got one eye on the political situation. Um, says and shows that actually increasingly people are put off by women's rights. The high point is before the suffragettes really get started. Now the counter argument to that is actually what would have been different in 1910, 1911 that hadn't happened in 1906 or 1896. So in reality, what's forcing there to be a change in government policy? Sympathy is all well and good, but if it doesn't make change, it's a bit of rubbish. Um, the government action, the government response, the WSPU, the force feeding, the Casamalf Act, did not seem tyrannical. Most people supported the government action because otherwise, what would you do? Would it kill any other common criminal? Could the Irish um, militants, Sinn Féin militants, if they did the same thing, would you just let them go? You couldn't have a society like that. So actually, the government action of doing the Casamalf Act makes perfect sense. And again, one of the key things is. Ultimately, no one in the political establishment wants to really fight for it. The Labour Party doesn't, conservatives, conservatives certainly don't, and even the Liberals. So therefore, because the people, because the masses are not convinced about the argument for women's rights and to vote, there is little political pressure on the government to do it. Ultimately, the government would only change their mind if there's political pressure, and that's just not there. So that by 1914... The WSPU, in light of its constant failures and the fact that the Pankhursts were a little bit autocratic, well, very autocratic and very hard to get along with and therefore alienated a lot of people even within the WSPU, the, the WSPU split in about four or five different ways and therefore became increasingly less effective. And generally, as time goes on, as public sympathy clearly wasn't being moved and sh showed support of the um, campaign uh, showed support the government, many campaigners drifted away from the NUWSS and the WSPU um, because it, just, it seemed like a pointless endeavour. So this meant that by 1914, the, the campaign was dead. And the camp Pankhurst, and some historians have said this is a cynical move, but generally this does seem like a genuinely patriotic move. They were very middle class and a glory, glory, hallelujah. Um, the Pankhursts call an end to the campaign and call upon all women to contribute towards the war the war effort to prove their worth as citizens. Now we are going to discuss whether the war actually helps women get the right to vote or not in a different lesson. But it's important to realise that what this does is this and undoes a lot of the damage and a lot of the anger towards uh, suffragettes in the sort of emotional um, unity of world war, of the beginning of a major war. People genuinely respected or at least hated less the WSPU for this action and this certainly doesn't hurt the cause in the long term. So that's it for tonight. Um, this is, we've only got one more lesson of the um, pre-1914 stuff of part one and that is Ireland and then we'll move on to the rest of unit one. But from that have a good um, evening, morning etc and I will see you in the next video.